love how many people are trolling on Shad now. Okay, Shadiversity, like, blew up in the algorithm. And then he, like, blew up doing, like, like funny, foppish sword man content where it was like, this is not a how th this is this is not a claymore. This is a hand and a half sword, and all of you are incorrect. Now watch me demonstrate the correct fighting style. <laughs> and the people are like, "Ooh, yes, mm, interesting. Ah, funny. Look at the foppish. Look at the foppish man doing the funny sword content." And then, and then he like immediately was like, "Okay, I have a platform now. Now I'm going to be the biggest cunt the world has ever fucking seen." And he just immediately pivoted into just being an asshole constantly, shitting on everything and saying, go woke, go broke ad nauseum. It was like, dude, it w couldn't have gone any other way. If you, if you like get a spotlight and the first thing that you do is like start throwing shit at people, like you're gonna, you're gonna get some people mad at you, especially if you get like huge, like massively successful on YouTube and then just for seemingly no reason. It's not like he made like a pivot, like he was like, okay, you know, I'm not really passionate about sword content anymore. I'm gonna talk about politics and whatever. Come watch my politics show. It was like, I'm still gonna do sword content, but now I'm going to spend all of my time talking out about how adding politics into things is bad while I add politics into everything that I do in the most obnoxious manner possible. It's just like, dude, you are, that is a recipe for failure. That is a recipe to, pr to like, piss off everyone. I don't know. Sirius says, I have a friend who used to watch Shad because he's super into weapons. He saw the fall, fall off as it was happening. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I understand wanting to, like, pivot into diff doing something different or whatever. You know? I get it. I've done that. God knows my channel has changed a lot over the years. Um, but it's a pretty it's a pretty major pivot to not just go from like swords and medieval like uh, tidbits of information and like and curiosities like, oh, did you know that this is called a doublet and that's called a, a problem. I don't know. I don't fucking know any of this fucking shit. I don't remember any of that shit. It's been a hundred years since I read Game of Thrones. Bo boiled leather, mummers, uh, some shit like that. Anyway, to go from that type of stuff uh, to being um, like not just talking about politics, but also talking about politics in like the most uh, scoffing, snide, alarmist, over-exaggeratory um, and inflammatory way possible, you know? Like, Sh Shad doesn't just, like, talk about his views on politics. He's like, well, yes, of course, the, the liberals, they want you to think that, um, they want you to think that, that, um, uh, that it's okay for people to be more than more than two genders. But of course, that's ridiculous. We all know that because in medieval times you could be a man or a woman, that we must be man or woman for all of time. Psh, fucking idiots. They just want to convert you to get rid of men. They want to get rid of men for you. My lovely imps, Chariot proved that Shadiversity, our foppish, sword-loving, Elden Ring-hating, anti-woke, go woke, go broke, 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 guy. Well, he lied. He lied about the woke, everybody. I know, I know. Who who could have believed that a guy who dresses up in a jester outfit and dances around in his yard and then screams about how gay liberals are would lie about something for money on the internet. But let's see what he lied about. I wanna see this, I wanna see this guy get exposed. Everybody. Let's do it. What are we doing? Uh, I am just stopping by to record. This is Chariot, Chariot TV. Go subscribe to Chariot's channel immediately because uh, uh, everything that Chariot makes is gold and you are missing out if you're not subscribed to Chariot TV. And of course, also if you're not subscribed to me, but Go subscribe to Chariot because that's who we're reacting to right now. Let's go. Something here real quick. As a little supplement to something we did on stream a little while back. I uh, reacted to this Shadiversity video. We watched about half of 
it, it was an insanity-inducing experience. And if that kind of nonsense is, is what you're about, then you can go watch I'm that totally if you about. want. It's on the channel, link in the description. Since you're watching this on YouTube, I am recording this. This is not a live stream. And uh, the reason why I'm doing that is because it probably wouldn't be that entertaining to watch live, but maybe if I cut it up just a little bit, you guys will at least see the point that I'm trying to make here and think that this is worth making. Okay, something, something that really always throws me for a loop. These guys, this has got to be the smelliest room on the fucking planet, okay? This guy is wearing, like, what equates to a winter jacket with a, another, like, a, a winter vest over it. Plus, you can visibly see he's got clothes on underneath. So, unless it's really, really, really cold in his studio, which I guess is possible, but... I don't know. None of these guys look cold at all. And that's a lot of layers, okay? And also, these guys put out a lot of videos and they're always in the same outfits. Which makes me wonder how frequently these, like, custom medieval outfits actually get washed. All I'm gonna say is, I bet it smells crazy in there. No, that's a hoodie. It's a piece of his merch. Why is it so puffy? Is that, is that, that, how is that, does he just have like a, is he wearing like a, like a work button up long sleeve shirt? I don't know. So somebody commented on the video when I did finally upload that stream segment that as I had talked about, Shad really went after the game developers conference. And they have an information page. He's kind of chunky. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's how, bo look, I, I'm chunky, okay? I'm a, I'm a heavy girl, okay? I know this. And when I wear a hoodie, it doesn't look like it's stuffed with goose feathers, okay? Ever, not ever. Unless it's like, unless I'm wearing something that's actually stuffed with goose feathers. So either, either, <laughs> Either Shadiversity is has a, a body type that makes his uh, extra weight look like goose down. About their different sessions. Where you can actually search things up and uh, like look at all of the different talks that they had. And they have descriptions as well. Which is really interesting. And I was thinking to myself, wait a minute. When I was there live, I didn't have this to work off of. I didn't know I didn't know that that was there. So I was just anticipating the problems that Shad and his two chuckleheads would have with it. And that's one thing. But it would be something else to talk about the specific ways that they misrepresented what these talks are about at base. So I think it, it's, it would be a little bit interesting to kind of go back through this do a little quick, you know, fact checking. Talk a little bit about what actually happened here. Perfect. I was gonna say, um, recently. Well, I, I assume that Chariot's gonna do this now, so I don't really have to. Um, thanks. And then touch on the newest update to the situation. So here, we're gonna go through a few segments of when Shad talked about the different uh, talks at the conference and uh, when they said some some interesting things about them. Training for a game design, sorry, Fair Play Summit, game, de, uh, sorry, kind games, designing for a pro-social multiplayer, because gaming needs to be kind. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Remember... Remember when just a few minutes ago, if you're watching this in the video, you wouldn't have been here for it. But earlier in my stream, which this video comes from, I was just talking about how the reason why Shad, Shad Adversity attracts so much ire from so many people is because he went from being like a foppish sword guy into being the most smug, 
cunt that you can absolutely ever imagine. Like that type of shit. Like I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to go and pick a random speech that some actual person out in the world that I don't, he doesn't know this person. It's not like he's got beef with whoever's giving this speech. He's just reading the title and it says, how to bring more kindness into games. He's like, <laughs> oh, kindness, who needs kindness? And then he complains when people get mad at him and make fun of him. It's like, dude, you're literally being like a stereotype of a jackass. And it's... Come on, like, I don't know. We didn't even have to go like 30 seconds into this video in order for us to have a perfect example of exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, it doesn't. You're right, it doesn't. First there was the- No, it doesn't. So here it says that this is a talk by Daniel Cook, Fair Play Summit, Kind Games, Designing for Pro Social Multiplayer. And you might think, oh, kind games. I wonder what they mean by that. Is it when players are nice to each other? What kind of behavior are we talking about? Well, it's interesting that Shad should offer a characterization of it because it's actually in the description here. Look at that. What does it look like to be, what does it look like to proactively design our games to facilitate positive human relationships? Games built on a foundation of kind aesthetics can deliver greater player satisfaction, greater long-term engagement, and richer human experiences. Internal studio research increasingly shows that social features facilitating friendship are highly predictive of long-term retention in online games. Despite this, many games are based on single-player or competitive gameplay and only add friendship-focused social features as an afterthought. We define kind games, kind games as multiplayer games designed from the start with systems that deliberately promote pro-social behavior. We observe this as an emerging design trend in hit multiplayer games like Sky Children of Light, Sea of Thieves, Final Fantasy XIV, Death Stranding, and even distinctly uncozy games like Elden Ring. Okay, small side thing. Sea of Thieves is not my favorite game in the world for a couple of reasons. Like, I, as far as, like, I... The, the whole game is... It's not, like, my favorite. I haven't played, like, an extensive amount of Sea of Thieves. But one thing I have to praise the Sea of Thieves for very seriously, that game does such an incredibly good job at convincing you to pirate it up with all your friends. Like, the fact that you can sync up your instruments to do the shanties, it just instantaneous, a feature that instantaneously adds social magic to a game. And I really do have to praise Sea of Thieves for that. Um, even though I played Sea of Thieves and I was like, uh, oh, this isn't really like the game for me in the long term. I had so much fun, uh, jumping onto a boat, shouting, using the little thing to, to, to the little, uh, speaker, speaker voice thing. What's it called? Um, not a bullhorn. Cause that's the electrical ones. Uh, a loudspeaker. I don't know what the thing, those things are called. A, a horn where you could talk and, and it's in game audio. So you could point it and be like, Hey. And, and then getting people to play the accordion and the little guitar and it, it's amazing. They really do do a good job. And I think it's I think it's worthy that at a game developers convention, they would spend some time going, wow, there's some magic going on here. How do we learn about this? How do we make improve on this and iterate off of this? Megaphone, is it a megaphone? Yeah, I guess it is a megaphone. I always think when I think megaphone and bullhorn, uh, I always think of the electronic version, but I guess a megaphone would still make sense even in a non-electric version. Yeah. Anyway, let's continue. In this talk, we hope to jumpstart the conversation by covering practical tools, constraints, and real-world examples. We'll arm you with ideas on how social-first design should be a top business priority, not an afterthought. You should leave inspired by the grand opportunity to... You should leave inspired by the grand opportunity to design multiplayer pro-social games that bring out the best in humanity. So... What's interesting about this is that this says it's for social systems designers, creative directors, and anyone who believes that games can help players thrive. But it says that there's a business angle to this. It's retention, player-based retention. So they have data, apparently, per the talk, and that would be what you would go there to see, right, to see if that's the case. They're suggesting that they have real reasons that they, where they can... They're suggesting that they have real reasons for knowing or justifications for believing that games like this can help people under... They're suggesting that they have reasons to believe that 
behaviors in these games, right, that you would normally, you, you wouldn't think of as, like, kindness intuitively. This is a problem with Shad, by the way. He always goes with intuitive reads. The man is so egotistical, he can't not behave like he already knows things that he needs to know to navigate a conversation. So he uses his intuition a lot, and it fails him a lot. And it's interesting because in this case, like Elden Ring, would you think of that as like a kind game? Probably not. But when they say kind... Some people would call that, like, in and of itself, like a reactionary tendency. But I actually don't think it's a reactionary tendency per se. I think it's actually what we would call knee-jerk reactions. Um, like, and that is, that's almost, it's almost worse in some ways on like as far as on a interper like a, a personal level if you're the type of person where everything that you see you just immediately react with the very first emotion and you're already tuned to be incredibly uncharitable to anything that you're even remotely biased against it just makes you like a very dumb person and a very annoying person to be around and a very annoying person to listen to like if the first thing that you do when you encounter something is just whatever your first emotion is, you just blurt it out. Like, that's like, it's baby behavior. It's the behavior of a literal child. But this is not a child. And it's not endearing when, like, a grown man um, uses an enormous YouTube platform to just kind of vent his, like, low-level, like, Ugh, I don't like that word. It's, 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 that's why I say it's like, it's almost worse than just, than being reactionary in the like political sense, um, on a personal level, because it speaks to an actual, like a, a weaker form of intellect. I mean, I will say that they run together, like people who tend to have extremely basic, uh, hyper emotional knee jerk reactions and don't like, like don't ever check those knee jerk reactions. Like those people do tend to end up being reactionary people in the, the political sense. Like, um, meaning people who are, uh, who view their, their political, uh, responsibility to, uh, to, to sort of be reacting to a changing world in the, you know, like that way. Some people call like the, that sort of thing reactionary in and of itself. And I don't think it is. I actually think it speaks to like a more fundamental immaturity they mean something specific don't they they mean something really particular isn't the uh, melody rain says isn't that the definition of being a reactionary not exactly um being a political reactionary does not uh mean like uh having a uh like a knee-jerk reaction to anything because if that was the case then they would also have a knee-jerk reaction to 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 any type of like political change, even one that's in their favor. Political reactionary uh, as a term uh, refers to a political position that is res that is like, that sees itself as, um, uh, as sort of like their political responsibility is to uh, respond to a changing world, to a progressive world and say, no, you're going to take it too far. It's too dangerous. As opposed to just being knee jerk in general. Um, it's a, it's a distinction, but I think it's one that matters. Yeah. Ex <laughs> reactionary is when you do react content. No, 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 no. Yeah, obviously. Not kindness as such, but pro social fostering certain kinds of social interactions. And that's interesting, right? Chariot says reactionary essentially means a social reaction to political progress, but knee jerk intuitions are definitely the domain of the philosophical traditionalist. That's what I'm trying. You, of course, said it better than I could. Uh, that's basically what I, what I was trying to say in a more clear and concise way. Thank you. Because if fostering certain kinds of social interactions in multiplayer settings creates uh, a more retention, that's good for your business. And there's an angle to this where people like Shad really would rather not accept this, unfortunately. But quite simply, when you think about it, there are business reasons for wanting to do stuff like this. It's not all an imposition where all these companies are going to go broke because they're going woke. They have business reasons for trying to do this stuff. You have to you have to try to see that here. Well, even so that like, was the increase. But, but even come on, like like I don't even. This is what this is why the go woke go broke stuff stops making any sense to me at all. And um, 
you realize like the word woke just it it doesn't really mean anything anymore. Like if you were to ask them, okay, what about this is like what what about this is even like like a I don't even know. Like what about this is even progressive, right? Like what do conservatives have conceptually or what do they have against the idea of making games that encourage people to have fun with one another and play together as a team? Like, I mean, I guess we're at the point of conservatism where they just do hate, they just do openly hate that stuff. I guess that's, the, I guess there is a value in someone like a Shadman type character or Sh why do I say, why did I say Shadman? Shadiversity. I do this all the time and it makes, it makes Doe so angry because I know that Shadman is also a conservative, but admittedly, I think is probably a worse person than Shadiversity. Um, uh, but their names are so similar. I sometimes say one or the other. Shadiversity. Um, I guess is a is a useful or interesting character because he kind of he kind of unintentionally uh, gives up the game, right? Like uh, it's not even about like uh, it's not even about like oh you know I don't like this this left leaning political agenda. Apparently now if you're if 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 chat adversity is to be trusted, um, working together, having fun as a team of people. Um, being together and enjoying the presence of other humans. These are all fundamentally liberal, woke things that are dangerous and need to be opposed, which what a depressing worldview. Like there is nothing in here that says anything about like, like what, like diversity or, or anything like that. It's literally saying this is basically, this speech is basically like a, a high school coach saying, one of the magics, uh, one of the most magical things about playing sports together is that you get to have the feeling of being a part of a team. And we want to make that happen. Every year we want to get together and make sure that we have fun as a team. And then Sh Shadiversity comes in and goes, well, that's, that's fucking liberal. Get this out of here. Uh, Fuck. You have to, you have to try to see that here. So that was the inclus inclusive design. Oh, no, no, this is a new one. Inclusive design workshop, weaving accessibility into workflows. Just bring out Helen Keller and get her use the I, I, I did that. <laughs> accessibility into workflows. That one confused. Is that like, again? So again, these guys don't know what they're talking about and they're not really interested in learning, but they do go out of their way to mock disabled people, which is about what you'd expect from a guy like Shadiversity, you know? I mean, I don't know. That's just, uh, again, giving up the game, my man. <laughs> it's like some, some random game developers like, Hey, I came up with some really good ideas for how you can make the workplace more, uh, welcoming and productive for people with disabilities. And they're like, oh, oh, disabled people. <laughs> God, I hate these people so much. Shadowversity is so fucking annoying. Why? This is the thing. Shadowversity is the type of guy where like if he was if he was if if he fell into the water in one of his medieval heavy armors, nobody would everybody would just laugh. He's such a dick that like there's nobody who's going to come to his aid because he's He's pissed everyone off already by just being a constant asshole. You know, it's like, who's going to stick their neck out for you? Uh, even if he was getting canceled by the YouTube algorithm or whatever he says, um, even if he was, no one's going to side with you because you're an asshole. You're a jackass that even people on your own side can't appreciate. Not wharf flows, work flows. We're not looking for Klingons. Weaving accessibility into workflows. What does it say, class? Let's find out. Let's learn together. This is by uh, Carrie Waterton, Senior Designer of Accessibility Rebellion. Uh, accessibility helps more people play our games, but it also takes an army. 
How can you take your passion and train people across disciplines to make more inclusive choices? This talk will enable you to run your own workshops to boost accessibility in your studio. Accessibility designer Carrie Waterton created inclusive design workshops inspired by Xbox's inclusive design sprints to train developers at Rebellion to consider accessibility throughout development in a way that is cost effective but still impactful. This awareness across disciplines helped to foster an inclusive design mindset and avoids unintentional barriers in our games. Carrie's talk covers the creation and content of the cross discipline workshops, the feedback, and the development that Rebellion went through to create an engaging and fun learning like experience. When you see the reality, like, obviously, any thinking person can watch Shad's video. I shouldn't say that. He has a lot of viewers still. Most people who have a heart and can think for even a moment can sit down and go, okay, this guy's being uncharitable. But if you take the time to go actually look at what he's talking about, it becomes abundantly clear how his only gimmick is sort of scoffing at things that he doesn't understand. You know? Like, it's, this is completely reasonable. You read this and you're just like, oh yeah, okay. So this is somebody who's really good at, at like a professional who's really good at understanding like the ways that you can facilitate the facilitate tools that will increase the sales of your game by being by making the game more accessible to people with disabilities and how you can do that without increasing costs you like it's so abundantly reasonable what's being talked about here that it when you actually see it it makes his stupid scoffing reaction just all the more ridiculous experience and the result and impacts and the result and impacts that the training has had on our staff and our workflows Attendees will walk away with a template to run their own low-cost, multidisciplinary accessibility workshops. They will be shown metrics around impact of the workshop to help them make a case for accessibility training at their studio, as well as advice and lessons learned from Rebellion's deployment of the workshops. So, it, it looks like this is basically for... Uh, it, it sounds like a little bit of both, Alora. When I first heard it, my assumption was, okay, yeah, it's like about like how to make it easier for people if you have a disabled coworker, but it sounds like honestly, this is about both. It's about both for gamers, for the gamers and for the developers, which again, it's just a super reasonable thing to have a GDC talk about. There's nothing like, I don't know. Anybody, yeah. you know, not really designed for anybody from any one uh, background or perspective, but it's interesting because they're saying like, make, okay, making your games accessible to more players, obviously that's a no brainer finance wise, right? Like you want more people to buy your product. Sure, but there's another angle to this, right? Like how do you actually get your office, right? Your team behind this? It's an interesting question. And that's what this talk would be about if you went to it. Um, so instead of just sitting there and being confused, you could look it up. And I think that that's important because what these guys do is they sit around and they make a lot of kind of insinuations about people. Yeah, look at the title of his video. DEI has infested the game developers conferences with endless propaganda. Now you want to talk about some clickbait. Oh yeah, the endless propaganda of going, hey guys, uh, we think we can save you money and make your workplace a better place and you'll sell more copies of your game if you think about this stuff in advance. It's propaganda! What the, what the fuck? Well, that are really unkind. You know, it'd be one thing if they didn't know and so they made a charitable assumption, but they're making uncharitable assumptions because they don't know. So they're weaponizing their own ignorance. <laughs> All right, so look at the next one. Climate crisis workshop, because that's what we need in games, right? Use your game development superpowers to fight the climate crisis. Uh. <laughs> no one cares. Oh, I, I'm sorry. But like anyone who wants to work climate change and making video games, it does not, <laughs> it does not work in the same, like if you have. So again, they just start BSing. Um, I think the no one cares there is pretty fun, though. I wanted to leave that in. It's just interesting. Like, obviously, we all know that, like, woke now includes caring about the environment. And to a certain degree, that's always been the case. You know, if you, if you don't, you know, want to 
you know, systemically grind up every small animal that you see. If you don't, if you're not like possessed by the urge to torment rodents or birds that you find, um, then you must be a gay liberal hippie. Um, you know, that's been, that's been sort of a hallmark of the conservative movement for a while. But like, this sort of soy facing rage reaction to like, hey, we're doing a panel where we talk about climate change. It's actually wild too, because climate change is like an incredibly, incredibly popular topic right now in media. Um, I swear to God, it's like a, it's a major theme in like tons of games. I just played Jusant, a game that was really, really good. Um, but I guess they, I mean, I'm sure they would probably think Jusant is like super woke or something um, because there's a gay person in it. But um, Jusant is a game that's like, not it's not preaching about climate change but climate change is a fantasy world that experiences a fantasy form of climate change is a major part of the game and it's like a really great game i don't know it's in like i'm trying to think it's in it's in death stranding um climate change is a huge part of death stranding like a, a, one of the most amazing games of this entire generation and I don't know, I guess they would I guess they would find that game too woke. Oh yeah, I should be I what am I talking about? I forgot. I forgot. They don't play Death Stranding because it's too fucking gay for them. Missing out when when you're a hardcore gamer and you miss out on the most um incredible and thoughtful and uh, uh powerfully in one of the most powerfully innovative games of a generation because it's too woke for you because they talk about climate change once or twice. I don't fuck, I don't even know. Sting though, right? Because. Oh my God, true. Mr. Crab says, Sonic. Yeah, w one of the most classic, one of the most famous classic video games series of all time. The, the, the entire, like Sonic was, that shit was, that was hippie stuff. In the original games, it's all about pollution and saving animals from getting crushed by pollution. Like, oh, I don't know. What, what, what is wrong with these people? Uh, nobody cares though, right? Yeah, no one cares. All these games that, are, that have climate change as a subject matter and sell like crazy, people talk about climate change, as a, but nobody cares. Okay, dude. It's so funny too, because these guys are always so convinced that everyone else except for them lives in a bubble. And then they scream in soy face that no one on the planet cares about climate change as if climate change is not consistently one of the issues that most bothers people. Whatever. Let's see. Control F. Climate. Climate crisis workshop. Use your game developer superpowers to fight the climate crisis. Wow. I wonder what this could be about. It's a shame that I can't use my two eyes and my ability to be literate in the English language to find out on a website. Oh, don't worry, Rambo, Rambo Krampus. Uh, nothing that I said spoils Jusant at all. Uh, Jusant, Jusant is a game that is, uh, it, it's, it's about the experience. There's not like, there's not like great secret reveals or anything like that. Um, it's a very, uh, emotive and visual game. Uh, don't worry, I didn't spoil anything at all. That's in fact, I think that's literally in the description of the game. Let's continue. I, that I can in, that I can uh, access with the World Wide Web. Fascinating. Um, wow, look at all of the people here at this workshop. Amazing. A lot of a lot of very qualified people actually. That's very interesting. This full day interactive workshop returns for the third time. Okay, so it's popular enough to keep coming back. That's interesting. That must be. <laughs> Obliterated immediately. Nobody cares. We've we've returned and sold out the entire speaking hall for the third year in a row. Nobody cares. Yeah, okay, dude. A lot of attendance for this. Streamlined and approved Soy. to teach teams and individuals how to integrate climate change and climate resilience messaging into their games. Through expert lectures and hands-on design activities, participants will both better understand the climate crisis and unlock their own superpowers as game developers, immediately applying new theory and practice to develop an original game pitch by the end of the day. So, you want to tackle this topic in a game? Here is a way to pitch it. We're going to help you workshop it. Seems fine, right? You could do this for, you could do this for any subject, you know? 
you want to make a game about a topic, well, you know, come to our talk if you so desire, and we'll help you uh, workshop the pitch. Seems fine, right? I how how could one possibly object to that? I mean, what are we what are we like pro climate change? Are we climate deniers? Is that what it is? Yes. It seems like that might be a little bit yeah, a little yeah. bit what it is sometimes for some people. I'm not going to put that on any specific people, but some people might feel that way. Participants will gain a deeper understanding of the downstream impacts of the climate crisis on individuals and understand approaches to build people's resilience to those impacts. Participants will learn Good fundamental night, Melody, transformational right. design approaches and practice applying these approaches with guidance from the workshop leaders. Participants will leave this workshop empowered with the knowledge, approaches, and processes necessary to add effective climate resilience messaging to their games. Hey, you're making a game, you want to make it about this, you go to the talk. You don't? Then you don't go. Seems, seems pretty straightforward, actually. Uh, seems fine. Um, independent Game Summit, the Black Gamic Language. The Black Gamer Language. No, 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 no. Gamic Language. Okay, so there is a... I don't know much gamer speak, but there is one particular <laughs> gamer word. Now, when I hear black in the title... That's not... That's probably it. not what they're talking about. <laughs> that's what I'm... <laughs> I was about to, I was literally about to go and do the exact same face that Chariot made right there. And Chariot just goes, whoop. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was so good. My, it's really funny too, because when I first heard this clip, I, I had to resist the urge. I was not streaming the first time I heard this guy say this. Because I saw this video a clip of this video before when he says this and I did the exact same thing when he says when the first thing that he thinks of is wow I want to say the n-word and it's just like I just I, I had to resist the urge to not just look directly at like be like you guys fucking hearing this because I was sitting alone in my own living room watching it on my by my by myself <laughs> thinking about that <laughs> maybe they caused you yeah a normal yeah they put those thoughts in his head somebody did anyway Fantastic. Well, the black gamic language. Actually, when I saw this, I was confused as well because I didn't recognize that word, gamic. Fantastically, we can learn about this. Spencer Garland, CEO, Creative Director, Brenda Arts, LLC. Hype Williams, but for video games? This presentation speaks to the newfound formation of a black gamic language in a similar way that Gordon Parks, Marvin Van Peebles, Spike Lee, John Singleton, the Wayans Brothers, Oh my god, this is a long list of names. <laughs> Ava DuVernay, Cheryl Dunier, uh, Boots Riley, Terrence Nance, and Terrence Nance. Okay, all right, we got through it. Developed what black TV and movies can be. Spencer Garland, along with other developers, are adding... I mispronounced somebody's name wrong. Somebody's going to get me for that. I got one of those wrong. I know I got a couple... I, I got one of those wrong. I always get people's names wrong. I still remember when people... Uh, somebody got... Don't let them get to you. Cherry... We must, we must together, we must harness our power. Everyone always mispronounces everyone's name forever. Never let the chatters gaslight you into thinking that you've done something wrong. The, and I, and I, I, can, I can sense it in you too, because I do it too, and I'm trying to get better about it. But these bastards in over here in this little fucking chat box, these bastards will complain about everything. And I just want to be like, let me listen to your conversations every single day because I bet you guys say everything like a fucked up weirdo, okay? And that, but because they're in chat and they can type and they don't have to record themselves, they can be like, no, you said it wrong. When in reality, people mispronounce shit all the time. There's like literally millions of ways to pronounce people, especially names. You, you might think something is like a French spelling and it turns out it's not even close to some other country and this pronunciation is totally different. Together, we resist these ped pedants. Really mad at me because I mispronounced um, a, 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 a director's name or something. I can't remember the specific circumstance. But it was a long time ago, and I still remember it. You literally, you literally have never pronounced my name right. Wait, okay. How am I supposed to say it? What am I saying wrong? Okay, but that, I actually am curious, because I say your name frequently. So that's one I'm actually interested in, in, in correcting.
Calliope? Calliope. Is that right? Cal Calliope. You! You people lied! Calliope. I didn't know that. Calliope. All right, so Cleope, Cleope, that's it now, Cleope, Calliope. All right, now I know. I'm still embarrassed about it. Uh, da, 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 da. Along with other developers adding their ideas into what black games can be, what new inherently black genres can be added to the medium of video games, what characters or worlds can be created. To reference Andrew Benjamin, black game devs have something to say. Okay. This presentation will go over the history of black life represented in games, understanding media literacy around stereotypical depictions of BIPOC people in games, the history of BIPOC game devs, and who is actively working to dismantle the systems that exclude black life and joy in the medium. This course about BIPOC aesthetics from film and how they can be translated into a gamic medium will also be expressed. I want the audience to think about how new references can be put into the video game medium. Black art is largely overlooked outside of rap music for game soundtracks. But adding those works into games will propel the medium forward. Fantastic. That sounds based as hell. Fantastic. Um, so this is actually really interesting. Um, the last time that I've like touched on something like this, I think, was the Blade video essay. That was a, a long time ago. But yeah, man, like, um, like, uh, like black cultural impact in film is super real. So it is interesting to talk about that in video games. Okay, yeah, sure. You know, S seems fantastic. Actually, this this sounds really interesting. Uh, this is this is one that I would go to for sure. Oh my god, it's only thirty minutes. Oh, <laughs> what a beautiful Spencer Garland, you beautiful individual. <laughs> Some of those other talks were like a, like a whole day thing if it's a workshop or like multiple hours. Thir thirty sweet minutes to talk about something wonderful. Actually, this sounds fantastic. Um, I don't know why anybody, we're not going to name any names here, would feel the need to reference the N-word in this context. That seems wrong. Educators Summit. So, like, I see, like, you can understand why they would get triggered by this one. But once again, gives the game away, doesn't it? Like, if your, re your reaction to, like, a black CEO a black gaming CEO talking about, hey, I want to see more black art in my games. And your first answer, your first thought is, I need to say the N-word right now. Like I said, kind of gives the game away, right? Kind of kind of just lets you know what they're all about. <sighs> Prototyping Afrofuturism, abolitionism, and climate justice through... <laughs> Now the pronunciation, now the pedantry is on the other foot, isn't it, Shadman? No, it's Shadiversity, not Shadman. Shadman's the guy who's in jail. I keep doing it. Game education. Wow. Have Ab uh, I, I, listen, if he can say abolition, I can call him Shadman, okay? Have you seen Disney's new animated series they're doing or movie? What's it, what's it? Oh, I don't know what it's called, but it's just like it's like Wakanda. Sorry, Disney I, and I climate justice through game education. Good catch. Good catch. Wow! Have you seen Disney's new animated series they're doing or movie? What's it, what's it? Oh, I don't know what it's called, but it's just like it's like Wakanda Disney. Hey. Have you seen that? No. Oh yeah, it's. It's got all that stuff in it. Oh, wow. Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. Again, this is that over push where they, you need black representation or black focusing in everything. And it's like, hang on, hang on. I understand, of course, having- See, he's bullshitting. Shad just goes, I'm sorry, I just bumped the mic. Shad just goes straight to bullshitting when he doesn't know what he's talking about. He just starts making it, oh, that, here's what this is really about. Are you sure? Uh, by the way, I believe it's abolitionism. <laughs> Not absolutionism, but whatever. Uh, I, re I still remember that. I remember I was quite nettled at that Afrofuturism comment because it felt like he, the guy just doesn't know what he's talking about. You can read, there's actually a lot of books. We'll talk about this. I, I promised I, I promise that we would. We'll talk about this someday. Uh, prototyping Afrofuturism, abolitionism, and climate justice through games education. 
Matthew Coupilton. Coupilton? Nice. Always getting people's names wrong. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, how can educators support students in learning anti-racist game design skills through prototyping unpoliced Afrofuturistic worlds? Huh. This talk provides answers to this question, sharing principles for learning experience design generated through an education psychology research study on learning in an Afrofuturist and abolitionist themed critical game jam. Through a series of design activities, Black and LGBTQIA young people imagined, prototyped, and playtested games that challenge systemic oppression prototyping and rehearsing black liberation. The speaker presents videos, quotes, and images of their process and their reflections on it, along with learning design principles these exemplify. These principles include prioritizing world building as a low barrier of entry introduction to critical game design, prototyping Afrofuturistic strategies for climate justice, and prototyping and rehearsing unpoliced futures. Okay, so it's, it's interesting, right? Because it's like people make a certain type of game is what this sounds like. There was a game jam. Okay, now I will be, I'll be completely honest. This description right here does seem like a, like a DEF CON, like a, like a DEF CON 3 type event for, uh, uh, for conservatives. Like this would activate, the first sentence alone seems like it would activate basically everything they hate. So this one, this one you can understand why conser anti woke conservatives would get mad about this. The first three, no, I should say, yeah, the first three were like, it's a stretch to even say that there's even something that even resembles what they what they think woke means. The first three were just like one of them was just like, how do you make games where people have fun together? The second one was like, hey. Disabled people work in our studios and play our games. How do we make tools that make it easier for them to do that? The third one was like, I'm a black CEO. I want to see more black music and more black art in my games. How do we do that? This one is the first one that seems like it's like, this is, this is kind of poking back at them, which is based. But they barely even... They barely even got, they, they got more mad at the climate change one than this one. And this one is like, how can educators support students in learning anti-racist game design skills? Damn, they should have read the website. They would have had a whole lot more to talk about. That already happened prior to this that's being reflected on. And then you go, okay, what do we learn from this? If you're trying to do this, you should do that, et cetera, et cetera. Again, this is wholly inoffensive. Uh, to, to peddle outrage over something like this is just despicable, in my opinion. And that's one of the reasons why I even talk about it in the first place. Um, attendees learn how to support game design students in prototyping future worlds free from systemic oppression. They encounter principles of learning generated through research on a critical game jam where Black and LGBTQIA young people prototyped Afrofuturistic games. Yeah, there you go. I mean, the, the takeaway kind of restates what's in the previous paragraph. Um, yeah, game design educators in high schools, colleges, and universities. So there's a there's like a pedagogical element to this as well, which is like how to teach about these things. Yeah, that was what I was gonna say. To to um to M mix dizzy says my only complaint is these theory terms are great to save page space, but these words can go over people's heads. Well, this one right here is the intended audience is for other educators, so it kind of makes sense that there would be a lot of theory terms in this one given that this is an, a talk that is being specifically targeted at people who are going to be familiar with those terms. So cool. Seems like. Yeah, actually, that's really neat. So no joke, LGBTQA2S+, and Global Queer Community Roundtable. What the hell does oh that even God. mean? <laughs> okay, I have, I have been in the room with some of these and obviously walked out afterwards, but it's just them in a circle talking about how it's just a victimhood meetup. <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. No, I no. feel like a victim of that title. <laughs> <laughs> Making the first Afro fantasy. Okay. Um, so something weird there about yeah, excellent critique, like, my victimhood guys. being made up. Westside Tyler, great to see you. Thanks for being here. LGBTQ, et cetera, et cetera. LGBTQ. Yeah, here we go. It's a round table. So presumably this is a, like a, a group of speakers, or maybe everybody participates. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So it says, 
LGBTQA2S plus and broader queer community faces uh, unique challenges in the that's weird it's weird sentence structure um, oh the I left off the the that's why sorry I'm tired <laughs> Uh, faces unique challenges in the games industry from discrimination and lack of representation leadership roles. Yeah, this guy uh, Affectionately elsewhere on the on the left here this gentleman and the white and the brown with the glasses. We call him nega Tyler uh, He's he's a like a lesser West Side Tyler. Oh the East Side <laughs> Tyler that, That's what it should be. I don't know why okay, it took now me I get it. To now I get what he's you're East saying. Side Tyler uh, <laughs> Uh, it's interesting though because he he said that it's just made up, um, implying that like people from the queer community are are not marginalized. Weird alternative reality that these guys live in. Uh, well, it's just funny too because they kind of give away the, again giving away the game. It feels like this this whole thing is them just giving away the game. They're like they laugh at the idea that queer people would what would have complaints but they the moment that they hear lgbtq they start laughing and they go what does that even mean where it's like okay first of all you guys have been making that joke for 10 years you know what it means like even if you don't like it you know what it means don't fucking pretend anymore um and but it's also just like the fact that they immediately respond to even the mention of lgbtq people at all that kind of kind of reveals the fact that yeah there is a fucking bias isn't there kind of fascinating so the the beginning acknowledgement here is discrimination and lack of representation in leadership roles to pay equity issues and workplace microaggressions so you know people are uh, mistreating you in the workplace uh you're not being paid the same as other people for the same work uh and then you're not getting promoted as much as other people as a demographic um, or hired for higher positions, as the case may be. Yeah, those are real issues. That's 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 real uh, inequality, you know. So unless you unless you think that like queer people are just less capable, which is weird. Uh, yeah, facts over feelings. People uh, just suddenly become a little puff of smoke the moment that you point out the uh, demonstrable fact that queer people of all types are heavily discriminated against uh, for pay um for hiring for promotions in nearly every industry that has been well studied and proven uh they just disappear you know they just don't all of a sudden it's all all of a sudden their feelings are really important um you know at, at least to say of a group maybe individuals thank you Alan, group, have a, uh, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for the kind so, words. yeah then that is a symptom of discrimination uh let's see discuss potential solutions for improving the representation and inclusion of queer people in the industry and in-game content Okay, you want to make queer stuff, so here's what you can do about it. You want to, you know, be a game developer or work somewhere in this industry, but you're gay, you're trans, etc., etc., here's how you do it. Uh, discussions include an overview of the current state of the industry, key areas of concern, and actionable steps to improve the representation and inclusion of queer people in the games industry. Yeah, um, so I mean, it does seem like it's, it's kind of a round table for uh, everybody to participate in, which is chill. Um, but it seems like everybody's welcome, you know, it's just focused on, on these types of issues to insinuate that like, it's just in like made up oppression is a little, a little weird. Um, you know, you, you'd think, right. That you can wouldn't I, just tell a I, bold faced lie like that, you know, cause that by the way, if you've been enjoying this, please make sure that you click like and subscribe down below and make sure that you also go over and subscribe to chariot's channel as well um chariot makes amazing amazing content um always very thoughtful and thought-provoking and there's a reason why um, i love reacting to chariot stuff her stuff is amazing and uh, you all should go subscribe to chariot tv let's continue that is just not true oh thank you alan Ice. Appreciate and it that. is it is stark how untrue it is. Um, all right, I guess let's skip ahead a little bit. Right? I'm not opposed to you know a MMO that's based in an African kind of fantasy adaptation. Right? Actionality in the first Afro fantasy MMO RPG: Lessons on intersectionality in game dev. 
Okay, this is where it got ruined, right? I'm not opposed to Wait, you I know, actually a wonder, MMO. I, I think I know about that MMO. I wonder if it's the MMO I'm thinking of. That's based in an What's African it? kind of fantasy adaptation of African culture and stuff like that. We have medieval European fantasy, you know, adaptations and Japanese fantasy adaptations, Middle Eastern fantasy adaptations, you know, that's Aladdin and, and all that stuff. So I'm not opposed to that. But now it's like, it's the, the, the fundamental thing that the, the reason they're making that game intersectionality hmm. and that's where you've jumped the shark because intersectionality is just a word for racism and bigotry basically well what um uh there's a game that is very similar to it's kind of based around um like some yeah it, again knee jerk this is neuron activation on the most basic level Ooh, bad word i don't like Malian, Haitian sort of cultures. It's called Rust. It's a very popular MMO oh RPG. <laughs> that, that, that's, don't worry, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. It's it's just like, you know, you're on the high seas, you're robbing ships and stuff. I am seeing some similarities in uh, Haiti. Holy shit. At the moment. Is that just like a dig at like people from Somalia and Haiti? That's a little that's a little weird. I mean, whatever, brother. So if you go to Crenshaw's Wikipedia page, one of the things that you'll find is if you scroll down, there's a little section for intersectionality. This is this is the lady. This is the lady. She did the thing. Amazing. Beautiful. Fantastic. Origins of the concept. In 1989, Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality in her essay Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. Finally. This is a, a PDF. Thank you, uh, Chicago Unbound and University of Chicago. Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination, Doctrine, Feminist Theory, and Anti-Racist Politics. Um, this is not, it's not a, a crazy long document, um, but one of the things that I would like to, like, point out is that guys like Shad, right? Uh, should I say this like he would? Okay, uh, guys like Shad, all right, okay? The way that they'll do this... Oh, your shad, your shad voice is better than mine. I always accidentally do a British voice, and I just don't care enough to, to change it. Your shad voice is way better than mine. Is that they will just bullshit their way through these conversations, okay? Uh, I would like to make some AI pornography of my wife's face on Supergirl's body. There will be three sons in it, okay? And uh, 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 I can draw... Actually, my, my art is at a professional level, okay? Uh, <laughs> anyway, sorry. <laughs> of, uh, he's, no, he's he's Australian, right? Of, I'm not doing myself any favors with my that's terrible a, That's a way better. That's a way better impersonation. What Crenshaw is critiquing here, and she says it from the beginning, is what she calls a single axis framework that is dominant in anti-discrimination law. Um, when we reacted to the real Radham Arch Warhammer debate, this this came up, and at the end I showed a clip from a talk that Crenshaw gave, and we, we watched a little bit of that and commented on it, because she explained in that talk, again, I'll link that video in the description, you guys can skip around to the part where we talk about that. She explains in that talk, what she means by intersectionality and where this idea comes from. Um, basically, the principle of the thing is if you had um, like a, a anti-discrimination suits and you're discriminated against, let's say you're a white woman, you're discriminated against for being a woman, you have a lawsuit, right, on your hands. Uh, same thing for being a black man, uh, not on the basis of gender, but on the basis of race. But for black women, there was a sort of bias against them because the principle of the thing appeared to some people that they would be given two bites at the apple, so to speak, I believe is the, the phrase that Crenshaw uses in that, in that talk. And so what Crenshaw was seeing is actually black women were getting less justice and less compensation because they belonged to two of those groups. 
And so what she tries to do in this essay is lay out exactly what's wrong with that and try to like forge a path forward. It's not an essay about how racism is good or whatever made up nonsense people like Shadowversity would like to push. Um, you know, if you guys like join I my... would love to hear his justification for why he thinks intersectionality is a, a code word for racism. But the reality is I know he doesn't actually have that like path of logic in his brain. Like he, he hasn't thought that out. It's just like, I know that intersectionality is supposed to be bad because of the conservative media that I've absorbed and because I see people angry about it. So it's gotta be bad. I don't think he actually, like I would be amazed to see if he actually ever can describe the reason why he thinks intersectionality as a concept is racist. I just, I, 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 don't, I don't know, like, I'm fascinated because um, one thing that you hear a lot of is that like, so conservatives will generally say, oh, they'll say things like, oh, diversity initiatives are racist because you, you believe that the bar needs to be lowered for uh, insert minority group here. And that's racist of you, actually. It's the bigotry of low expectations. That's what they like to, um, that's what they like to say. That's like their usual approach. But the intersectionality thing, saying like intersectionality is racist. Like, how do you even come to that? Like, what do you mean by that? Like, how do you even come to that? I've, no, I've not heard, I've not ever heard a conservative explain that. But also I don't hear many conservatives like ranting and raving about intersectionality explicitly. They usually just go intersectionality. <laughs> That's a cringe word I don't like just like Chad is doing now. Uncle Gumball says, cause you're just supposed to forget about race. Yeah, maybe, I guess, but it's like, that's not even really what intersectionality is talking about. I don't know, it's, it's weird. Yeah. Discord or whatever, I guess I'll link that in the description too. Um, you can hop in and I'll send you like whatever Crenshaw stuff. Oh, it's stuff. funny. It's funny too, because this is really weird, but um, there are uh, class reductionist leftists, quote unquote, who actually do attempt a critique of intersectionality. And I, it's a flawed critique, but, and I can't believe I'm doing this to their credit, it's at least grappling with the actual concept of intersectionality, if in a flawed manner. And the class reductionist lefties basically say that intersectionality is a tool that convinces people to basically spend their time um, trying to add up oppression points. And uh, I don't think that's accurate at all. I think that's quite silly and a fairly weird way to approach it obviously. Um, but at the very least, the, the, the class reductionist leftist types, they're actually, they're actually talking about something. Whereas the conservatives are literally like, you know, they're just, they just hear the word intersectionality and go, that's racist. And you go, what? Oh, oh, get them chariot, get them, take them down. I happen to have on hand or any other like CRT stuff because I have been reading about this and we'll be doing some more videos where I talk about it. Um, it's not, it's, it's not easy, right? Like it's not a, it's not a perfectly easy subject to cover because it's a complicated topic. But I think that like the way that people like Shad would prefer to talk about it is like, it's just reverse racism. That's an old canard that got thrown at racial justice when I was a child. It continued when I was a teenager. And now, you know, it's still happening when I'm an adult. So I guess this is just the way things are. And this is just the way uh, people. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's another good point from Chariot. The reverse racism is another one that conservatives will use. But again, the reverse racism thing usually isn't directed at intersectionality specifically. They're usually saying like, oh, well, you know, any diversity initiative or whatever is usually what they aim that at. It's very strange to me to see these guys like 
specifically being so negatively activated in such a thoughtless way to intersectionality specifically. I'm gonna interpret this stuff. And Shad, in uh, complete bad faith, by the way, just because he's willing to make things up about people, which I think I've shown here uh, and elsewhere as well. Shad, because he's a liar and because he's willing to just talk a load of crap purely out of ego, is just bad-mouthing this, this scholar, right? And I, I just think that's not okay. You, you really, you know, if, if you wanted to critique Crenshaw's work, I think that's fine. In fact, I, I think in an academic sense, it's actually welcome. But this is, you know, saying uh, actually, sorry, that's Michael Knowles jump scare there, saying uh, actually uh, when they say, okay, when they say that uh, they want intersectionality, what they're saying, okay, is uh, actually racism is good. I, you know, if you can, I, I, if you can give me where Crenshaw says that it's uh, cool to be racist, uh, then I, I guess I, I'd have to fold on that point. Um, you know, just send me the context of where she says that, like an essay or a book and like a page number or something, and I will look into it to potentially revise my stance. But until such time as you can do that, um, I don't think guys like this know what they're talking about when they're talking about Crenshaw. It's kind of, it's kind of absurd. And one of these days, we'll prove that with Cytation. Just wanted to answer a YouTube, a YouTube chatter asked if I play piano. Yes, I do. Patience. But today we're, we're just talking about a Shadiversity video. Change the rules, co-ops, unions, and other labor structures. Like, again, you thought this doesn't have direct ties to uh, socialist, communist kind of policy. The whole, whole DI, it's the redistribution of wealth, redistribution of labor, and, uh, you know, taking things for what people have and you know, all that stuff. It comes down ultimately to communism, essentially. And, and now they're actually yeah, trying to just, push actual co op the, the idea that co-ops are communism, god damn it. I, I hate that there were people who were pushing that. That's that that just really lights a fire under me because it's it's you know show please show me where Marx said that again um, or or just like where where are you getting this from? But I think this is an important point because if we search it up, of course, we'll get to hear what it's about. And we'll see whether all this fear-mongering is really worth it. But before we read this, I would just like to say, we didn't we didn't do this part in the original React. Uh, <laughs> when he reacts that way, I think it's a bit of a tell. A lot of people have expressed this, this question, like, or, or just kind of an implicit sense, I guess, would be a better way of saying it. Either they're wondering why Shadiversity is the way that he is, or they're they're really invested in like this this kind of feeling, or have divested themselves rather from this this uh, channel from Shadiversity's channels once they found out that he is this way. So they had a realization at some point. I can't tell you how many people I've seen um, my comment sections, especially other pe a couple other people's comment sections. I saw this a bunch at one point in, I think, one of Tyler's videos, Westside Tyler, shout out. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen this a ton. It's actually kind of incredible. A lot of people have been saying that they're, uh, they're done with Shad. And I think it's interesting to think about why that might be. And I think if you look at this, this particular objection, the fact that he is immediately jumping to like, oh my God, it's full communism when you have unions. I mean, like teachers have unions, man. Or like, is, are all teachers communists? I don't think that makes any sense. You know, I, I just don't think that makes any sense. But he... the state of the conservative uh, culture war is an endless front, quite literally. It is it is war against all things that that they don't that are like that they believe are different at all. It is anything that even gives them the slightest idea of um kindness or or you know doubt in the current order of things is dangerous it is incredible um and i mean i don't know 
this is how they always trend, right? It's they've got this purge instinct where it's like, if you're not perfectly in line with my asinine and underinformed, stupid, smug, uh, bitchy worldview, uh, then uh, you have to die or something. Like that's that's ultimately what it comes to. It's just like, yeah, they're gonna laugh and try and mock anybody who says, you know, hey, maybe bosses shouldn't have the right to like beat their employees, and they're like, fucking hippie. And it's just like, oh, like this is where we're at. But the fact is, it's always where conservatism is at. They, 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 they get tired, you know. They, uh, they work themselves up. They blow a load in their underpants, and then they get tired for a little bit, and then they go right back to it every single time. <sighs> e Shadowversity is an employer. I've seen him do do videos where he talks about hiring people. These guys here, these little chuckleheads, they work for him. They're his employees. So every time you watch a Shad video, you have to understand this is a guy who is paying these other people. He's their employer. So when he goes on a rant about how how scary and spooky unions are, that's a bit of a tell. Uh, I can't I can't readily imagine Shad's employees unionizing to any great effect. But if there were some sort of larger like content creators union or something like they that they were a part of. That would be a way that they could bargain against any any you know poor pay or conditions that they had as a result of the way Shad runs his business, and Shad that is impressive. Like that is that. So sorry, you know I I think I think that's a bit of a tell as to why he's this type of guy. Um, some people you know they get a little bit of power and they're just the same person you always knew, and some people they get a little bit of a power and they become like a drive-through tyrant. You know, care. Somebody said that Shadowversity was live right now. Um, hold on a second. There you go. There you go, Joe Dax. It's Chariot TV. Apparently, uh, somebody said that, that Shad was live right now. And I wanted to go see. It might be on his other channel, but I wanted to check on this out of curiosity. It doesn't look like he streams onto this channel anymore. And I just find his live stream list very funny. Medieval nerd, Elden Ring, Let's Play. We got, I'm struggling, YouTube is still broken, what can we do to fix it? Exposing YouTube and fighting back, reacting to a medieval trailer, reply, how to make everything. I don't know, there's something, there's something funny about all this. With his, the way he does his reaction faces, I don't know. There's just something about it, okay? I don't have anything really to say, but it just made me, I mean, besides that, it just made me laugh a little bit. It just looked funny. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't know who said he was live. I don't think he's live, but I just thought it was kind of funny. Anyway, let's continue. That was just a random thing. Karen's that kind of guy. Shad has big Karen. Jinx says, he, recently he's been complaining about his ad revenue and subscribers dropping. Of course people are going to dip when he criticizes the rings of power with racist and sexist remarks. Yeah, I mean, his channel has gotten more and more ridiculous, and it's going to alienate people. But I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's, uh... I, I said exactly what I thought about Shadowversity and his channel. Uh, you know, uh... He has not made a lot of friends anywhere. Uh, his approach to talking about basically everything, um, it's not, it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't even appeal like, it doesn't even appeal to the, the angry people because he doesn't have the ability to generate uh, fear and anger and panic like, uh, like a Tucker Carlson type does, you know? He doesn't have it. He's kind of, he just kind of whines smugly. And yeah, I don't know. Anyway, let's continue. Energy in a lot of these videos. So anyway, co-ops, unions, other game labor structures. What's it about? Join us. Wow. For a lively discussion, for a lively conversation. I'm already getting it wrong. About games and work. Led by industry expert Marie LeBlanc Flanagan. Not going to get the names wrong anymore. From Game Arts International Network, who dug deep into researching worker-owned video game studios, I probably got it wrong anyway, and unions in games, oh, there's another name, Michael Iantorno, is that right? I hope that's right. 
from Concordia University. This session presents a wealth of insights from their compelling comic and supporting white paper in exploring alternative labor modes like co-ops and unions in the gaming industry. Um, so again, you know, gain unique perspectives from representatives of acclaimed co-op studios like AO underscore OP, like pronounced like co-op presumably, but it reads a bit differently. Uh, Glory Society, Future Club, etc this is a i mean to fear monger about this is is a nothing burger there's there's no reason to be upset about this there is no reason to 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 be angry about this to fear monger about this it's uh ridiculous we we'll just uh, speed run the rest. So, so empowering through games and collaboration in and with Africa, navigating leadership insights from LGBTQ plus. Oh, they didn't have. That's not inclusive enough. It needs to be LGBTQ A two S plus. Thank you. You reckon the group saw was like, oh crap, oh, crap, this crap. Is what are we doing? Oh, that uh, excluded people. I gotta go to the cancel culture one now. <laughs> so this is LGBTQ plus management in gaming because if your manager is an LGBT person, that that joke doesn't even work. That joke doesn't. I don't even. What is the joke? So the joke is they made fun of LGBTQIA2A2S before. And then now the joke is that, oh, I mixed up the letters and I'm going to get canceled. Don't you think that you would have gotten canceled for making fun of the concept before? Or maybe for making jokes about the N-word? Or maybe for making blatantly racist jokes about people in Haiti? I, it's it, it just what what's the what like the joke doesn't even work just better because they're lgbt which is inherently bigoted in my mind but that's what they actually think like it is preferential something to be celebrated and lauded hang on insights from lgbtq plus managers in gaming so we looked at the the talk earlier that was about how there are fewer uh, queer people in managerial roles or leadership roles um this just has a takeaway the description is really short it says attendees will leave the lgbtq manager uh, roundtable equipped with insights on inclusive management practices personal growth strategies and the importance of advocacy They'll be inspired by success stories and empowered to foster LGBTQ plus inclusivity within their organizations, promoting diversity and positive change in the gaming industry. So like, here's some stories from these managers. Here's how they deal with uh, stuff. Here's how they succeeded. You know, here's what you can do. It seems pretty straightforward. But again, Shad has to put this coat of paint on it like these people are supremacists. There's there's nothing supremacist about this textually. So he's just reading into it uncharitably and writing a fan fiction for his followers. Yeah. So that's Shadowversity. That's the kind of guy that he is, uh, once again. Very interesting, but that's not the end of the story. Because as you might have noticed, there's another Shad video on Night's Watch. GDC devs scream at the sky like babies to change industry, and it's <laughs> embarrassing. Welcome back to the watch. Nathan, have you ever How much we want to bet that we're going to see some baby rage and none of it will be footage from GDC. Had a moment, a time in your life where things are just so apocalyptic you needed to scream. It's kind of your whole bit, my man. That's kind of your entire bit. <laughs> He literally says that he gets, like, he will literally say, this shit is so dark. This, this leftist communist bullshit is spread so far. It's depressing. I'm angry. It's like literally his whole show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, don't self report. <laughs> you know. I, well, I would say, when times get tough, I have outlets for things, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't say it's screaming. Yeah. Because that hurts the voice. It, well, it does, know. but also, like, like, what type of person, or I, I should really reframe person to say age, do you see people just lose it and just start screaming? Yeah. Like kids, basically. Baby, yeah, yeah, kids, children, babies, <laughs> essentially. Ivory Inferno says, 
Shad is literally the squealer. What is he on about? Ah, right? Do, are we, have we forgotten the Elden Ring review? By the way, if you're watching this and you're having fun, you gotta go right now and watch my response to Shadiversity's Elden Ring review. It's a video up on my channel. Just search Elden Ring on my channel and you'll find it. I promise you, you will not regret it. That is the perfect example of Shadiversity working himself up into a baby rage and screeching over nothing. It is amazing. Not only that, he got so mad at Elden Ring that he ended up getting in a protracted beef with a guy who pointed out that he was factually wrong. Very gently, mind you. Uh, a, a, a YouTuber that I really like called Zeostorm um, pointed out that like Shadiver Shadiversity just didn't, he just was wrong factually about certain elements of his critique of Elden Ring. And it made Shad so mad that he made a screeching, raging response at a guy who was just like, dude, I think you're kind of wrong about this. Uh, okay, so this may, this is interesting. GDC, mm -hmm. game developers. Call so it, it's a it's a video where he calls them babies. Uh, it, it, he's gonna rip into the GDC devs. We really don't have to watch the whole thing. Oh damn it! I, I just wanted to, to play a short little clip there. Does he get mad? Just a, a little bitty clip, just so we can get a taste of of what his coverage of that was like, how he led into it, how he set it up. Uh, these people are like babies screaming at the sky. Oh my gosh, they just want to change the industry. They're screaming like babies. Man, um, I really don't think YouTubers have any room to talk about this. This is a profession Woo! almost predicated on having over-the-top emotional reactions to things, which Shad does all the time. I don't know about screaming necessarily, but the guy has gone into hysterics on a regular basis for a long time now. I mean, it, it, he'll get red in the face, he'll be yelling, he'll be raising his voice. Again, you know, like a temper tantrum. I think anybody can do this. You can be like, oh, you're losing your temper, you're like a child. Okay, well, you know, what's, hap what's actually happening here? Well, there's an article about it, and we can just read the article. We don't have to trust Shad's coverage of it. At the Game Developers Conference, the games industry really needed a good scream. 50 developers met today for a coordinated group, sc group scream to lament the state of the industry. So here's some people. They're dissatisfied. They're expressing it uh, I, in an emotional scream. Like, it's a, a big group event. I think, you know... I went to one of these at my college. It was called uh, Primal Scream. And it was a, uh, it was a sort of tongue-in-cheek... Uh, 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 finals, uh, you do it during finals week. At the end of finals week, there would be a big festival, and one of the events that they would do was called a primal scream, and you would go there, and they had tons of free food, and they had tons of free, uh, like, hot chocolate and all kinds of stuff, and they get everyone together, and you just do, you just yell together. Like, it's for fun. It's for... It's like for getting stress out. It's not super serious. I mean, sometimes there's a statement attached to it, you know, like, wow, that was stressful, but it's really not the, it's not the, it's not the biggest. Don't red pill guys do big scream on their events too? Yeah, they do. It's really funny. I don't know. It's just, it's, these, these guys got nothing. These, these fucking medieval LARPers, they don't, they really don't have anything. They've got nothing. This is what, uh, no wonder, no, uh, no wonder. No wonder nobody, no, no wonder they're having audience burnout. It's fucking tiring. Functionally, uh, it's, uh, by the way, this is at the Game Developers Conference. They called it GD Scream. Calliope. Good night, Calliope. Good night. Sanji says, I don't get why they feel so threatened by the consideration of different needs. There are so many areas where it can help people to live a different, a better life. Office design can be done in a way to support neurodivergent people to do their everyday job well. This might even be helpful for neurotypical people. Research helps us understand that better by step by step. Well, yeah, I mean, these people are afraid of shadows. People like Shad are, uh, they are quite literally afraid of of every single noise that happens around them that they th that they project liberalism onto. It's very weird. 
yeah, it's it's interesting. So it says one of the organizers wore a shirt printed with uh, Munch's The Scream. Another participant wore a shirt printed with an ice cream cone. At exactly noon, the cluster of individuals from all corners of game development let loose a loud scream that lasted for several seconds. As it trailed off, the group broke into relieved laughter and applause before slowly dispersing. Yeah, look, it's they literally they all laugh about it. It's it's this is like. The, it's so common. Every single college does little events like this. It's eh, whatever. Um, they, it, you know, they they said half jokingly on Facebook. They posted about this uh, this feeling of powerlessness that they had, and uh, then people actually saw, hey, like this would be a funny thing to do, and they got together and they did it. And it seems like people appreciated it because they all got to experience uh, this terrible state of this industry and then they got to come together and see other people who had the same feelings as them so what i think this is is it's really affirming you know i don't think organizing an event coming together to support each other and then laughing about it afterward is really that childish you know if, if you're just focusing in on the micro like oh there a scream happened okay well i see a lot of people raise their voices all the time doing all kinds of work especially nonsense youtube videos where they snipe at people you know i'm not doing it here i i've i've i'm sure i've yelled on stream before though like i'm 100 percent sure i've done it i think there's a i think there's a clip on the i the... definitely have i definitely i i'm proud of when i've yelled on screen on stream before gaming channel where i'm playing code vein and I have this like bad Xbox mic from years and years ago, and I scream when I fall off the map. Classic, classic uh, uh, stream lore. You know, whatever. Sometimes people yell. Uh, get over it, I guess. But the thing that's interesting is that there's real stories of people working in this industry. Um, this person, uh, Siegel, noting that while they had a very blessed 16-year career in games, they were struggling to recommend aspiring game developers to enter the industry due to the current conditions, which they said were uh, tragic. Yeah, um, I've seen a lot of coverage of this. Uh, frankly, it's it's really sad. Um, like, for example, here, the layoffs in the past couple of years have been absolutely horrible, said Robin uh, Lobuglio. I'm, I think that's right. Names. Uh, gameplay programmer at Tender Claws. My partner was actually laid off almost 18 months ago. It's nuts. It's nuts. We scream because we're angry, but also we're here because we really want people to know that you don't just have to be angry. You don't just have to feel hopeless. And I think it's really urgent in this time that people use the leverage that we have, that we unionize. Uh oh. Uh oh. Whoa. What is this communism? Uh, Joseph Stalin? Oh, you want to be in a union? Whatever. Uh, sorry, Shad's just such a clown. <laughs> Uh, because while you have a job, you have that leverage, there's still time. I think the last year has shown us that if we don't stand up for ourselves, they will treat us like trash. You know, it's interesting because this sentiment being uh, expressed here, um, that that they have to stand up for themselves and that this industry is in a really bad place, this has real stakes for these people because this is their livelihoods. Yeah, it's actually wild too because the game industry is in a horrible state. There has just been month after month after month of major game studios ma doing mass layoffs over and over and over again. Obviously, the people who work in those industries are going to be pissed off about it. Like, not even just the ones who lose their jobs. I know people who work in the games industry who have had their workflows disrupted because their company fired people that they were working with. They kept their job and their job is worse now because they lost people that they relied on. You know, like they have bills to pay based on having these jobs and they're talking about like terrible layoffs and stuff like that, bad working conditions. Um, the state of the games industry affects these people arguably more than anybody. Whereas Shadiversity has an online career where he will just snipe at video games, usually directed at the devs as well, by the way. Frequently, he'll he'll snipe at he'll snipe at developers, and we've seen this in his his weird little tantrum about uh, GDS, which is, or GDC, excuse me. GDS is the event. GDC is the conference. Um, it's just it's just really unfortunate. This guy has zero self awareness. Um, at the end of the day, you know, like what's what's the absolute worst experience that somebody can have, uh, like with these games from the perspective of somebody in Shad's audience? Like, oh, I bought a game 
and there was a bunch of progressive stuff in it and uh i wasted my money because maybe it doesn't work really well or i didn't like it okay you know like this is karen stuff basically and i'm not saying that caring at all about products and and good like consumer side protections is being a karen but i am saying that being this level of bitter and 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 just cruel about it that it that does trend into karen behavior but people like this don't see it that way whereas these people actually suffer i'm sorry dude it's it's such a bigger deal like oh you you put money into a bad oh you saw that a new the new game oh there's like a black lady in it or something boo hoo these people are losing their jobs hello cleaver you know they got they got families to feed it's such a difference and i just think that the the behavior is so on the one hand like fragile on chad's behalf and then he turns around and he belittles these people he calls them children but they're the ones who really have it the worst. So it's just pathetic. It's just pathetic. And this man, I think, is is like constitutionally lacking in empathy. He has oh, absolutely. no soul. This is a soulless man. This is a man with no I, I actually do yeah, I, I do think it's like a lack of empathy thing, but I think also the vibe I get from Shadowversity, and this is a little bit of armchair psychology is more um fear like he seems like a guy who's genuinely afraid of everything um like i, I don't think it's j just a lack of empathy and this is again armchair psychology here i don't know the guy but uh from everything i've seen of him he genuinely just seems afraid of anything changing in a way that he's mildly uncomfortable with like it truly seems to scare him to his core i don't know I do think he he is lacking in empathy, though. Obviously, I mean he he just laughs when he hears like, uh, yeah, um, we we did this cool thing for disabled people, and it also saved our studio money. And he's like, ha ha ha. No heart. So, that's all I had to say about that. I just wanted to give you guys a little update on things I've learned, things I've seen since I. This man has no balls. Um, basically, is what you is what the conclusion of this is. No, I'm I'm kidding, of course. Um. Shad, Shad Diversity is one of those guys where, um, there are so many dumb chuds on YouTube, okay? And reacting to most of them or analyzing most of them has become increasingly boring because they're just boring people. I'm thinking of someone like, um, like, uh, like, uh, What's his name? The Quartering. The Quartering is genuinely unwatchable. It's not even funny to see his stuff. Um, the same thing goes for Tim Pool. Like, Tim Pool is somebody where I was just like, there's no shot that we're going to react to anything that Tim Pool does that's not like a debate in his studio. If it's somebody else there arguing with him, then it gets kind of interesting because he's on the back foot. But his actual, like, his core show is so boring and repetitive it's almost unwatchable and shad diversity is also repetitive and boring but his sort of clumsiness and buffoonery is unique and uh i don't know i like that he gives the game away all the time that that's very funny to me there's not a whole lot of conservatives that like do it like that that like unintentionally uh uh just blow the cover you know, because people like uh, Michael Knowles and, and Matt Walsh, those guys are like the far right dudes, you know, like their show, they do do media stuff, but their show is, is like, it's an obviously, you know, it's an obvious show that's supposed to be like, yeah, you know, we're the, we're the, we're the side that won't, you, you don't get to hear us, even though we have huge platforms. They're just like, you know, you don't, we're the suppressed speech. They're the ones, we're the dark side, you know? And people like Shadiversity and all these like middle, middle road guys, um, they're supposed to like, they're supposed to kind of like, pretend that they're like just media guys that you're the regular guy you know he's he just likes medieval stuff but he can't he can't do it he just kind of gives it all away it's it's funny and i you know for for all of his baby rage i do appreciate that i appreciate the buffoonery on display 
And, uh, but more importantly than that, I appreciate Chariot. Uh, all of you should go make sure that you subscribe to Chariot TV. Of course, this video will be linked in the description when we put it up, but here's the link right now. Go leave some love, comments, likes, and go subscribe. And of course, if you like this video, subscribe to myself, Demon Mama, as well. And I'd love to invite you to tell me your thoughts down below. Are you a former Shadowversity fan? Uh, I've heard from a lot of you. Uh, in fact, the last video I did on Shadowversity, the, the Elden Ring one that I mentioned, which you should definitely go watch, the last time when I talked about that, I the comments were full of people who said they used to watch his stuff and that they even still kept watching for a little bit when he started doing politics stuff, but that they've been completely inca incapable of engaging with his stuff the more and more it's gone on because of the smug, annoying callousness that he constantly puts on display. It's interesting. Anyway, thanks for watching. Deeply appreciate it. Deeply appreciate you. Keep hearing the city.